evidence of genocidal intent. And this is where the story and the stories, the blending of science, scholarship, and legal practice, in fact, only begins. Thank you, Predrag. I think that's a great introduction into your expertise into this topic um, and just the importance of language when it comes to prosecuting genocide, as you've as you've mentioned with the Mlanich trial. Helena, would you like to do a brief introduction? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm sorry this couldn't be in person, but this is really amazing as well. Um, so I'm Helena Ivanov. I'm a final year PhD student in international relations at the LSE in London. And I work on the role of propaganda in war and mass atrocities. The specific focus that I work on is the role of radio and television of Serbia, or RTS, which is the Serbian national broadcaster, in the breakup of Yugoslavia, specifically during the wars between 1991 and 1995, which covers Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia, but does not cover the conflict in Kosovo. Um, I guess. One of the reasons why I've decided to do this as my topic uh, is because I'm Serbian. I was born and raised in Belgrade. Um, I guess the second part of it would be that my mother was an oppositional journalist in the country under Milosevic's rule. So I guess I sort of got the chance to experience firsthand what it looked like to work in the media at that time and how journalists who supported the regime uh, lived through those years and what happened to all of those who opposed the regime, particularly if they were journalists. Um, in my research, and if you could now share that screen um, where I'm going to explain uh, what what I'm currently doing and please do ask any questions or provide me any feedback because this is really research in progress. So if you think something's really wrong, I would really appreciate it to say that. Uh, one of the things that I've realized as, this, as I started my research is that there is a huge disagreement between scholars when it comes to the possible power of propaganda and altering people's views and behavior and particularly in violence. Um, th th there is a huge range of scholars in international relations, particularly those studying civil wars, who argue that propaganda doesn't really matter, and that factors which are considered more strategic, like opportunities for looting or, or rewards that one can get, are actually crucial uh, in the process of encouraging people to engage in violence. Um, then there is another set of scholars who really claims that propaganda is important and one of the most crucial factors in encouraging people to engage in violence. But in a lot of that research, I did not find that scholars are carefully differentiating between concepts. So there would be pieces of work that I've read which would say that there are five things about propaganda which lead people to engage in violence, and one is dehumanization, and then another one is demonization, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't really clear to me what, for example, distinguishes dehumanization from demonization, or how either of those really change people's minds, really turn people who used to be friends and neighbors into perpetrators of mass atrocities, really turn those people into killing, make them kill each other. I found some exceptions to that kind of research, which comes from Jana Gizabadrot and Scott Strauss on the Rwandan genocide. But Scott Strauss reaches a conclusion that the RTLM made no difference. It played a very marginal role in the Rwandan genocide. Seven years later, Jana Gizabadrot conducts a research on the same radio station and during the Rwandan genocide and concludes that as much as 50,000 lives could have been saved if the international community uh, if the international community jammed RTLM transmitters. So those two scholars who do a much more detailed analysis reach mutually exclusive conclusions. So instead of trying to prove the causality between propaganda and violence, I've realized that a lot of my research actually has to be about what is propaganda doing in a conflict? Because only once we establish that, then we really try and examine its power to alter people's views and behavior and at the extreme encourage them to engage in mass atrocities. And to do that, I've analyzed RTS broadcasts aired during the Yugoslav Wars. I've managed to obtain access to all <coughs> broadcasts aired from 25th of June 1991 when Slovenia and Croatia declared independence all the way down to this December 15th, uh, 1995, which is when the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed. And on the basis of my analysis of those broadcasts, I arrived to this model of propaganda. So the first thing that I'm arguing is that to structurally think about propaganda, I think we need to distinguish between three phases. So there is the escalation phase for which I argue starts when regimes decide that violence is in their best interest or when they decide to start a war. The escalation phase for me is a phase where the government and, or the regime is trying to build narratives and escalate the narratives that it, it 
that are targeting the out group, that are targeting the enemy. I then argue that at some point propaganda has to reach what I call the maintenance phase, which is for all sorts of reasons, there is no need for propaganda to escalate further. For example, in the Yugoslav case at the end of 1991, for all sorts of reasons that I'm not going to get into because I'm limited in time, uh, it was neither in Milosevic's nor Tujman's interest for the war to continue. But they both knew that the Croatian problem wasn't resolved. So stopping the propaganda wasn't an option, but there was no need to further escalate it. So I argue that that is the maintenance phase where the discourse is already established or repeated, but don't necessarily change or evolve. And then the final phase, which I think has been largely ignored, is what I term the de-escalation phase, which takes place as wars and as, as regimes and governments become aware that they have to end violence, that they have to end the war. And therefore, they have to pacify the population. They have to explain to people that all of these arguments in favor of war are no longer valid and no longer true. And that instead, now we should praise peace and accept whatever peace that the government or the regime can get. I then move on to specify that a little bit, and I argue that the second part of the model is the function of propaganda. I try and broadly speaking categorize five functions, but I'm not in any way claiming that this is an exhaustive list. It just seems to be something that repeats across cases. So the first one is to recruit the fighters, which depending on who is starting the war might be more or less relevant. For governments, this might be easier because they can conscript, but for certain insurgencies, they perhaps have to invest more effort into recruiting. The second one is to brutalize perpetrators. In genocide, we witness violence that goes way beyond mere killing, from mass rape, body mutilation, all excess and brutal types of violence that occur in genocide. So for that, I agree, I argue, propaganda is one of the tools used to brutalize perpetrators, to, to turn extraordinary violence into something really, really ordinary and common. The third one is to legitimate violence, which I think is the most important function and continuously needs to happen. And there is an extensive research in psychology that shows that it all things being equal, people tend to find violence quite repulsive. So ultimately, they need to the governments need to find ways to help people overcome psychological obstacles that they have when it comes to engaging in violence. The fifth, the fourth one is disincentivized resistance, which can come both from the general population or political parties, or even from the soldiers themselves who may decide to desert the troops. And the final function is to pacify the population, which is related to the de-escalation phase that I've just talked about, which usually comes towards the end of the war as the regimes and governments have to prime the nation for whatever peace deal might be found. The third level of the model are the discourses, of which I argued that three are targeting the outgroup. One is dehumanization, one is threat construction, the third one is guilt attribution. And then I argue that conversely, there are three discourses targeting the in-group, which are basically boosting the power of the discourses that are targeting the outgroup. And that is humanization of the in-group's members, particularly the victims, grievance construction, what is the legitimate grievance of the in-group, and then finally, valorization of violence, of the behavior of the troops, of the regime itself. In the end, one of the other interesting things that I found, particularly as I watched all of these broadcasts, are techniques. Techniques which media outlets use to be able to persuade people into the validity of the discourses that they create. One is straight up inventing, just fabricating the news or altering the facts of an event to the point where the event really doesn't look anything like what actually happened. The second one is agenda setting, artificially increasing or decreasing the relevance of a particular issue. The third one is manipulating, which often occurs by using past historical events to portray them as unfinished or to portray the outgroup as the eternal enemy of the in-group. The fourth one is mirroring, by which I mean accusing the outgroup's members of committing or planning to commit acts in fact committed or planned to be committed by the in-group. And then finally denying, simply denying that certain events have taken place or simply denying that the in-group's members are actually guilty of that. I'm not arguing that this is like a silver bullet argument or, or, or a model of how propaganda works, but I'm merely arguing that it could be quite helpful in really identifying what propaganda is doing and what a regime is trying to do with propaganda and only then move to really examine whether and to what extent propaganda might be effective in fulfilling any of these functions. But that's the sort of thing that I'm working on right now. Thank you so much for, for that overview of your research. It honestly is just fascinating and I can see it applying to many situations and definitely our discussion. Um, Lynn, would you like to briefly introduce um, you and your work and then we can get started with a few questions? I think I lost you. Can you hear me? There you are. There you are. Great, great, um, great. Um, yeah, I... I do have slides, but since everything got messed up, I think I won't use them. 
Um, and instead, I will just talk to you for a few minutes. And I'm actually going to set up my phone so I can see the time. Um, so, so um, my research is I, I'm a philosopher of language, so I don't do, um, you know, empirical data gathering in the sort of normal social science sense instead. Um, but I do work in the field in the sense that I, well, let me just explain. Um, earlier today, we, we heard from uh, the very distinguished professor um, and jurist, uh, William Shabbos, who I couldn't hear his talk because I was teaching, but who has been very influential for me. And in a, law, a McGill Law Review Journal in, um, I think, 2002, he wrote that the road to genocide in Rwanda was paved by hate speech. And I read that and I was like, oh, I have to read this article. I have to find out what his theory of language is. And of course he didn't have a theory of language. He went on and talked about other things. So then I started looking at what was out there because um, I had worked on hate speech in the US for a long time. What was out there internationally about um, the connection between language and violence. And I wasn't finding much. So I started to really dig in to the research on Rwanda and did that for, I don't know, five or six years. And then um, I finally went to Rwanda and I went around and talked to people and I just asked them questions that helped me answer things that I was not finding in the literature. And I learned a lot about what social scientists call snowballing, where you know, you ask a question of one person and they give you an answer, but they tell you, but you should really talk to so-and-so. And, you know, basically sort of made my way around the country. Um, I didn't take everything I heard on face value, um, but I did learn a lot. I learned a lot. Okay, so the theory of language that I work with is called inferential role semantics. And um, when Helena talking about some of the techniques um, and the, the sort of like where you can't get the, the question about causality. Um, inferential role semantics sort of sets causality aside and says, look, all of this is happening in the normative realm. And so what happens is our linguistic norms start to change. And so we start to say, it's okay to talk about these people that way. And so in Rwanda, it became okay to use words that can be translated into English as snake or cockroach um, to refer at first only to <clears throat> the um, um, RPF fighters, but then eventually to all Tutsi, and then eventually um, these, and, and originally only in um, subgroups of the Hutu, but then eventually it spread to be a common usage amongst Hutu across the country. And so this is about the spread of a discursive practice. Once that practice spreads and becomes, here's a word that we're much more comfortable with nowadays, normalized, um, <laughs> it becomes normalized, people don't pay as much attention and they don't always realize that they are on the brink of violent escalation. So when you talk about um, escalation, some of my work is before the escalation. It's about um, that normative change. I actually believe that genocide begins in language um, or it starts with language. It starts with the things that we say to and about each other, um, the way that we license discriminations at first purely verbal, then behavioral and ultimately perhaps deadly. And the very first step is dividing us and them. But of course, we can't just say, no, 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 you can never divide us and them because we have many differences amongst us. And some of those differences are very important to note and they can be sources of joy and celebration. So it isn't that all difference is a problem. It's when differences mapped onto dominance and where that is a source of injustice. Um, also, um, to use another kind of ugly word from uh, recent days is it's about, uh, well, I won't use the ugly word, but it's about making enemies of those who are different. Um, so what it takes is normative changes that not only um, 
generate us them but takes us them into polarization territory and then also that those normative changes start to break down the murder taboo and to promise impunity um, that's if you don't do those you're not going to get to genocide you may get to violence so in the U.S. right now, we see a lot of escalation um, of violence against um, violence against Asian Americans um, that has not turned into all out genocide. I don't actually think it will, um, because I don't think that the um, discursive norms have changed enough. Um, there's a whole structure that goes with inferential role semantics that I don't really have time to get into. But I think that um, it can really help to think in terms of what are our discursive practices? How are those practices changing over time? How are they targeting groups? And then those groups are, um, and then behaviors against individuals of those groups when I say targeting, what am I saying? I'm saying that they are identified. They are identified as in some way not worth being around anymore and that that's a problem. So I wanna just give you one quote to wrap up. It's actually something I sometimes start with. It's, um, it's from a published source in uh, John, Hatzfeld's, um, John Hatzfeld's book, Machete Season. And this is from one of the genocidaires named um, Pio, and he says, maybe we did not hate all the Tutsis, especially our neighbors, and maybe we did not see them as wicked enemies. But among ourselves, we said we no longer wanted to live together. Notice that right there, there's no slur, there's no target word. Um, just, we said we no longer wanted to live together. He continues, we even said we did not want them anywhere around us anymore, and that we had to clear them from our land. It's serious saying that. It's already sharpening the machete. And so in my work, in my early work, I looked at things, I called them derogatory terms and even deeply derogatory terms. Um, but I think that in order to understand how you get to something as cataclysmic as genocide, you need to look way beyond slurs and derogations, and you need to look at a wide variety of speech acts that change social norms. And I think that's a good beginning. Yes, thank you so much, Lynn. I really appreciate all of your um, introductions and explaining what you're studying and how it's relevant to genocidal language. Uh, just to clarify with the audience, due to the um, somewhat strange beginning we had with technical difficulties and all that stuff. I really value audience interaction. So rather than having a separate Q&A session at the end, feel free to put your questions in the chat now and we will weave them into the discussion because um, I, I definitely want to have your questions asked more than mine. Um, but I want to begin at the very beginning, so to speak, because throughout the day today, you know, the um, the man, the important man, Raphael Lumpkin, has come up frequently in coining the term genocide and I want to talk about and get each of your different perspectives on how having a literal word a, a piece of language to describe these atrocities um, for victims for the accused um, using it within propaganda like how has actually having a term to apply to the situation changed the overall environment and so, Predrick, I'm going to begin with you, and then, as I said to um, the others, interruption, disagreement, that's all welcome here, co-moderating with me. So, Predrick, I pass it on to you. Uh, thank you, Bree. Well, this is a huge question, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, the word, the concept of genocide, obviously, is used, has been used and will be used uh, by uh, many different people and communities in many different different ways. Uh, so uh, if I can uh, go back to, and again, paraphrase what uh, William Shabbos once said, genocide is uh, first and foremost a legal concept. Uh, why is it first and foremost a legal concept? Uh, it was created by a lawyer for legal purposes. Uh, the, the name of the Genocide Convention says it all. 
Uh, so um, I think this is uh, essentially where we should uh, begin when we talk about genocide. That is not to say that the word itself would even exist without philological and historical knowledge that uh, uh, Raphael Lemkin had at the time when he was uh, coining, minting uh, the word, uh, you know, uh, from, from uh, Greek and Latin. Uh, so, um, uh, that again is to say that other communities are not only more than welcome, they're absolute and necessary ingredient uh, and participants in all legal discussions about uh, the, um, the uh, different, different manifestations uh, and elements of, of genocidal acts, uh, if you like, including specific crimes within the umbrella. And so, um, I am not going to go into uh, legal uh, discussions here, but I want to tell you how um, gen the, the use of the word, the concept of genocide can have uh, uh, serious consequences within uh, a particular social context. In 1986, uh, in uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, the, the Academy of Sciences and Arts, uh, Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, created and leaked a document called the Memorandum. The most distinguished representatives or some of them from that academy uh, in that memorandum partly argued that there was an ongoing uh, or upcoming uh, upcoming genocide that is going to be committed against the Serbian people. Uh, well, uh, Ed, that was the first time that I can remember that um, a, num a number of authorities within an institution that holds a position of great authority in a society um, utilized the concept of genocide by referring to the cultural genocide against the Serbs in Kosovo and so on and so forth. In other words, um, the word, the concept of genocide uh, penetrated the society uh, with uh, its gravity as, as it has always had, obviously. So it began to circulate. And since I was there at the time, I remember that uh, apart from various publications, that appeared as a result of this leak uh, of that um, unofficial document at the time it was published much later, uh, people begin to talk uh, about this at home, uh, to whisper about the genocide, to uh, uh, create and come up with example of uh, horrendous crimes that were committed against the, uh, the, the Serbian people and so on and so forth. So uh, in the minds of the population, the genocidal record uh, uh, was, was already being created uh, at the time. Uh, and so, of course, um, that was just a moment uh, in, in a much broader uh, propagandistic context, if you like, but it was one of these uh, key moments, I believe, that may have contributed to the shaping of the perceptions of, of the population in Serbia as uh, basically being threatened by an imaginary genocide that was going to. So, this is one a potentially negative uh, propagandistic use of, of this uh, concept. I don't claim that in law, every time lawyers use genocide, they, they uh, use it legitimately and the difficulties are really truly immense. And I, this morning I heard a question uh, during the opening presentation, how do we distinguish between crimes against humanity uh, and, and genocide? Well, <laughs> It's not an easy question to, to answer in practice. In theory, it is easier to uh, uh, answer that. In practice, I can tell you that uh, many meetings, um, uh, many meetings I remember where we discussed this fine uh, gray area uh, based on evidence that we had at our disposal, whether you should charge uh, in a case uh, someone with crimes against humanity uh, or genocide, or as a matter of fact, both, which is uh, often uh, the case. Uh, so um, I can give you some specific examples that come from that are very much linguistic 
and propagandistic, and that is, um, for instance, um, well, uh, persecution is a crime against humanity. Uh, is right. It's a crime against humanity. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, a, a substantive crime, another crime called direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Both of these crimes are crimes of specific intent. They are both specifically targeting groups listed in both uh, crimes against humanity list of crimes and uh, the uh, genocide convention. So, so the difficulties are are in 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 law and legal practice can be significant in some in some uh, cases. Um, but perhaps I should stop here and uh, <laughs> give the opportunity to <laughs> Elena and Lim to respond. Yes, no, I I loved your response, Predrag, and I think it's important to highlight those those keys key elements. But Lynn, can you offer a, a philosophical? Um, approach to the creation of this term and how it's changed the environment or if it's changed? Sure. Um, um, I really liked uh, pre drag. I really liked your, your response. Um, and, um, in particular, the way that, um, every, you're going to think everything I think about is how things leak out into and seep out into the normative sphere, but the way it, uh, a concept that did not exist and then is created for the legal realm then becomes part of common discourse and can be used to instill and inculcate fear um, and i think fear I and mean, that's something else i would have talked about if i hadn't come so late but fear is another big element of it and um for me as a philosopher something that i don't see a lot i mean i have i have issues about intent. I can't wait to have more conversations with pre about that in the future. Um, but but um, when I think about the difference between um, genocide and other horrific large scale crimes, for me, genocide is is actually a very philosophical crime. It's a metaphysical crime because the idea is to eliminate a whole category of humanity from existence. And so that's metaphysical, it's ontological. Um, and so if that's the purpose of the crime, you can see why that would instill fear. Um, and you can also see how the various elements of the definition fit together. And so I, I think that for, um, you know, in Rwanda, they did not have a word in Kenya Rwanda for genocide before 1994. Um, they came up with one um, and, you know, everyone in the country knows that word now, <laughs> but, but um, the, the, and the, the, the boundary policing about what is and isn't genocide um, is often um, there's, there's pragmatic elements, there's practical elements. There's also various kinds of um, power plays involved. But at bottom, for me, it's about the met the metaphysics of uh, of the totality of the scope of the eliminative crime. I hope I made that clear. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so, um, Prajak, do you have a response or? And um, well. I had a very technical response because my problem here is that, 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 that there is no problem. I agree with everything that's been said so far. So that, that is a big problem. <laughs> so, um, uh, from, um, but but what, what may have triggered sort of uh, something else in my mind is, 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 is addressing both um, um, Aline's and, and, and uh, Helena's uh, areas is when Lynn uh, mentioned uh, fear. And there's something interesting that I have uh, uh, myself identified while, while working on a number of propaganda cases at the ICTY and then later doing uh, more substantial research in, uh, into uh, the trial records, as a matter of fact. Well, there is this concept of um, hate speech or hate propaganda. So if you look at if you look at jurisprudence or trial records, 
uh, people usually tend to to look at hate. We we think that hey that that is a that is a trigger that triggers something in people and po potentially uh, a, a crime or 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 a, a, a pattern of of crimes. As a matter of fact, well, what I've actually discovered is that uh, there is um, uh, an evil twin there. Um, in jurisprudence uh, that judges may have um, unintentionally, instinctively uh, brought together the CME's twins, hate and fear, they come together. And then I did some more research, uh, scientific research in cognitive science, and I realized and learned that, in fact, they are together. Uh, they're, they they correlate to the same part of our brain often. Uh, so uh, judges, judges, in fact, made inferences on, based on evidence that was introduced in a number of cases, bringing together hate and fear as some of the, the uh, elements and triggers of, of specific crimes. So when Lynn mentioned fear, I thought, hey, why do we always speak about hate propaganda when we can, in fact, uh, speak about fear propaganda as well, and that is not a recognized concept in law uh, to begin with. But uh, so I think that, for instance, Helena could could bring a change <laughs> in in this area with her research and say, look, um, there is um, a whole lot to be said about the role of fear. Uh, in particular, fear propaganda and various manifestations and responses to fear, uh, right? Um, uh, in in um, in a under the particular specific circumstances, always <laughs> context yeah. is a very important uh, uh, word uh, in in not only law but science as well. So uh, I'm so glad you brought up. Fear Can versus hate, into, and I really in, want to bring Helena in on this. So please, please go. <laughs> yeah, I kind of just wanted to jump in on this fear propaganda point, which is an interesting term, and I might even put it in there because I think that through my analysis of the broadcasts uh, in 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 the RTS case, I think it was exactly fear that ultimately produced hate, and that if one looks at the broadcast, what they were actually trying to tap into is fear. They weren't necessarily trying to portray throw it to some hateful, demonizing creatures or beings, but more often there would be links to the events from World War II, uh, mm -hmm. links to the Ustasha regime, an attempt to create this connection between all of those people from World War II and all of those people who exist here right now. And when I've conducted interviews with some of the people who fought on the Serbian side, so many of them have witnessed that they joined the fighting forces because they didn't want to get killed like their grandparents, because they didn't want to witness their wives or mothers killed like their grandparents did. So many of them invoked the imagery of World War II and everything that has happened then. It became clear to me that it was fear from what the other side might do to them that motivated them much more. And um, I even have a very good um, quote that I'm going to use to open up my thesis, which I think communicates this very nice. So it's a person interviewing Serbian women uh, in Bosnia. So it says, I asked out of politeness whether the fighting in the village was heavy. Why no, there was no fighting between Muslims and the Serbs in the village, she responded. Then why were the Muslims attacked? She says, because they were planning to take over the village. They had already drawn up lists with the names of the Serb women who were to be taken into harems for the Muslim men. Harems, yes, harems. Their Bible says men can have harems and that's what they were planning to do once they had killed our men. Thank God they were arrested first. She wiped her brow and continued. How do you know they were planning to kill the Serb men and create harems for themselves? To which she responds, it was on the radio. Our military had uncovered their plans. It was announced on the radio. So it was literally this whole image, imagined scenario that was never going to happen, that was solely based on fear of what is going to happen to me, that ultimately led to a person thinking, well, violence against them is justified. And, and I think that's totally sensible because it kind of, it taps into instances in which we would consider violence to be legitimate. Mo most people, excluding pacifists, would think that violence and self-defense is okay. And I think what propaganda is often trying to do is to portray violence committed by the in-group as self-defense or preemptive self-defense. Yeah. And, and people just don't talk about it enough. I, I just don't, I didn't well, find it in the literature that much. I, I didn't, I'm not an expert on the legal theory or anything like that, but I haven't seen it there that much either. 
that's why your categories of your techniques really matters, Helena. The, um, the, when you were going over that, I, I know it was very quick, but I kept thinking, Donald Trump used all of those, um, and especially mirroring, you know? So, um, you know, Hillary's a crook, lock her up. But I, I don't want to get into that right now, but, but a lot of those techniques um, are very common techniques that fascists use and neo-fascists and wannabe fascists, um, um, authoritarians who want to control the population. So there's a kind of, um, in, the, in the escalation and the techniques, in both of those, I know there are different categories on your chart, but there is um, a manipulation of the population so that they can be controlled by the people who have a plan whatever that might be. And last thing on that, the, about the fear uh, propaganda, I, I always come back to something I'm not actually very expert in, but you know, it's on my list of things in my someday I must study category, which is the um, internment of the Japanese in the US um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And so many people, students across the years have, have and, and other people have said, how could the US have done that and again, that's it was about fear. They said, you know, how can they how can they take a family that has been here for three generations and um, put them into the camp? And the answer that the U.S. government gave is, well, basically they're like a sleeper cell. You know, they they were the Japanese were playing a very long game, and they were going to come and get us now. So we had to put them in these really horrible camps out west. Um, um, and so again, fear was part of, um, was, was there, there was a catalyzing event, which was the bombing of Pearl Harbor during, and the declaration of war. But the fear of the other, when that other was not feared before, can be something that comes on really fast. Um, yeah. No, thank you. I mean, I've really enjoyed this discussion and just talking about the differences between yet the similarities, strangely, of hate and fear and how it all plays a role in language. And I think Kathy asks a really important question that I want to end with, although I wish we could be talking for hours because I have so many questions. Um, if someone wanted to start to do a self-directed learning on the power of language, to, to otherize and dehumanize categories of people, what sources do you recommend? So what is a good starting point for the audience who is possibly inspired to learn more about this? And we can go around briefly and share some sources or methods that you recommend. Um, and Predrag, I can begin with you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there is a problem there. This has been studied so much and so well. And there is a long list of publications, in fact, from different areas, different disciplines. Um, so uh, there is a, a, a new science called cognitive social science or sciences. Uh, so there is a sort of merger, a hybrid between social sciences and, and cognitive science. Um, that, had, that has been uh, uh, the dehumanization, derogatory terms, uh, uh, slurs, uh, demonization, and so on, uh, have primarily been studied by social psychology and social psychologists. So um, there are experiments and books that I could recommend, but I would have to sit down and, and make the long list of articles and books that actually explain um, well, uh, in my last edited volume, for instance, I have I have a good good uh, um, a chapter, an excellent chapter on um, dehumanization, uh, dehumanization uh, by uh, Celia Gillard, a former uh, Yukon uh, student, and Lazana Harris, one of the leading social psychologists in in this area. And Lazana has studied for many years uh, how people. Uh, respond to various groups uh, that seem different, like homeless people, uh, like beggars, uh, like, you know, uh, people that are just out there on the streets and are not noticed very much. And so he studied uh, how our brains respond to them 
Uh, and that is, uh, he also published an excellent book. I can't come up with the title right now, <laughs> but it is an excellent and the number, a number of articles. So, um, I think, I think that this is one avenue of research. Social psychologists uh, give us some of the best explanations currently uh, as to how uh, we as people uh, respond uh, and dehumanize often unconsciously, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, so the experiments, there, is, there are lots of experiments that are just absolutely fascinating. Uh, the, the best experiments are when you feel embarrassed when you read them and you think, oh, no, you know, I must have done this more than once in my life. And that is actually when you find yourself as, you know, part, part of the scholarly work that goes beyond the book, <laughs> you are in it. Uh, I'm <laughs> so so. Lazana Harris is one of many many uh, brilliant uh, social psychologists. I would recommend uh, certainly. Okay. Thank you. That that name has come up in my thesis research as well. Um, okay. And reading <laughs> and reading that type of work. Um, any other recommendations for sources, Lynn, uh, Helena? Uh, so, so I'm happy to because the list is just so long and. My master's thesis was on dehumanization. What I'm happy to do if you want one is I can um, take the bibliography of my thesis and sort of highlight the particularly relevant ones and then I can email it to you and feel free to distribute it among whoever participated. But uh, what I would just want to say as a comment very quickly though is that it was very surprising to me how useful psychology ended up being. Uh, both because like it was the only area where I even came close to direct evidence that it has an impact also because I was so surprised by the extent of an impact that it has. Um, but also psychology was really useful in terms of explaining other aspects as to how and why people otherwise. For example, the whole concept of cognitive dissonance and how people who, for whatever reason, are forced to commit violence and don't believe in what they're doing, find themselves in a state of cognitive dissonance. And then the whole explanation as to why people can't live in that for a sustained period of time and that overcoming it sometimes involves just believing what you're doing. So anyway, psychology was really useful, but if, if you want, I'm happy to happy to send you the bibliography and then you can distribute it. Yes, that would be great. And then we can um, cite those sources and put it on our website. We do have a tab uh, titled resources that we break down genocide resources by region as well as um, overall category. So that would, yes, that would be a huge help. Um, and then Lynn, any final words as we have the last few minutes to wrap things up? Okay, so, um, um, I I would recommend Jason Stan philosopher Jason Stanley's book, How Propaganda Works. It's Princeton University Press from like 2015. Um, it's a very um, robust, no, robust makes it sound scary. It's a it's a rapid a rapid run through a lot of different philosophical literature that's relevant to the question of propaganda. Um, and he started very um, significantly with Victor Klemper's work on the language of the Third Reich. Um, but he he brings in a lot of different sources from uh, 20th century, um, late 20th century and early 21st century philosophers of language. Um, the other area I would, the other um, um, work I would recommend is in social psychology. There's, I mean, not social psychology, social epistemology. Um, so it's like the, the, so epistemology is just for all viewers, um, the theory of knowledge, but social epistemology um, is a change of pace from traditional epistemology, which was uh, very technical and um, a little bit uh, off-putting. Social epistemology asks questions about um, <clears throat> what is it to be um, a responsible knower? What is it? to get your information well. Um, they talk about epistemic virtues and epistemic vices, the dangers of echo chambers, the dangers of a lot of the things that are kind of all around issues about propaganda. Um, I would say for me, propaganda really matters a lot. And so I don't mean this comment to be in any way dismissive because I think propaganda is crucial, but I also think it's important to recognize 
the wide variety of speech acts that we engage in that propaganda fuels and that it licenses. And so the idea that our speech licenses other speech and licenses other behavior, I think is a really important takeaway um, from our discussion. Um, and it's central to my work. Um, if we just think of um, you know, speech as something that happens as a one off, then we're never going to get to the root of the problem. We need to understand that I'm saying this now because someone else said that before. So I got to tuned in to thinking about fear instead of hate because I had a long conversation about Rwanda with the now sadly late um, Alison Desforge, who is one of the great scholars and researchers in Rwanda who was who was there through the genocide. She worked for Human Rights Watch. And Allison just kept saying, fear, not hate, fear, not hate. And I kept saying, but hate has to count, you know, and over time I've come around to her view. So we need to um, um, recognize that we are constantly learning from others and that we get to say what we say because we took we were licensed by others and we carry it forward and we are issuing licenses to other people and saying, yeah, run with this. Um, take this idea, take this norm, take this concept. And that's also a reason my last point is to look at there's some literature um, in philosophy um, by my colleague at Cambridge, Ray Langton, on accommodation and particularly accommodation of attitudes. So we have a tendency to want to agree with each other. Um, we want to be, um, you know, I say I love the Red Sox. I don't actually follow baseball. And, and you'll be like, yeah, great team, because you don't follow baseball either. But anyway, so this idea of accommodating the beliefs of others and accommodating the attitudes of others um, and bringing attitudes into the discussion of language, I think is really, really important. I know we're out of time. I could go on. <laughs> no, I really, I really appreciate everyone's um, input on everything, and I, I completely agree with you, Lynn, that there needs to be some comforting element in disagreeing. There's nothing wrong with disagreement. It's when that turns into putting that viewpoint on the person, and that's all who they are, and then that turns into dehumanization and otherizing, and hopefully not, but it could escalate to genocidal tendencies. Um, I just want to thank you panelists for your expertise and your time and your patience with me as we figure out the technical aspects of this audience. Thank you so much for your patience and your time as um, as well as just asking the questions that have guided our discussion. Um, we are currently starting a discussion on Myanmar in our in our other room uh, that you can find on our website. So please join there. This recording will be available on our website. And again, just thank you so much for joining and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. Thank you, Bree. Thank, you, Bree. So Thank you so much yeah. for organizing it and inviting us. Absolutely. My pleasure. It was a blast. <laughs>